So, what is metadata and why should I care about it? Clearly the question that you're going to ask why you're here. And uh, I, I use this example, actually. I like food. I don't know if you can tell. Um, but if you look here, you can actually see, no, no, typically we look at a recipe and we see all the different items that are part of the item that we're creating. But a recipe is very different than metadata about the actual item itself. And you know, if, if for those of you who actually watch calories and carbohydrates and all those good things, this has been a real breakthrough, having some standards um, around how do we describe the nutritional nature. Very different from the recipe, um, understanding sort of the, the numbers and the, and the identifiers around um, the piece. And this is really the metadata associated with that particular item that's being made. So in the same way, when we take a look at metadata um, for books, uh, if we look at the top, there's data, which is the actual, you know, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, the actual piece itself. But then the metadata is about the title, the author, the publication, length of the book, readability of the book, I mean, a whole variety of other kinds of information about it that let you be an intelligent consumer about that resource. So many of you are probably participating and have metadata today of one sort or another. What we're going to look at today is LRMI, the Learning Resource Metadata Initiative, which is about the standardization of some aspects of that metadata and how that can be useful in your business. Um, AEP has played a really important role um, in terms of representing the insight from the publisher's perspective. It's amazing the things that we know in this, in this area that we assume that in fact a lot of technical uh, groups don't really understand. Um, about how we already classify publications. So we look at overseeing communications within the community, um, informing the development tools that are there, what publishers actually need to be successful, and then looking at oversight of the actual proof of concept process that we've been going through over the last few months. So I think the AEP is doing a great job representing your interests. Um, and uh, Charlene, of course, is the, the CEO of that group who uh, introduced us this morning. So, um, so what about this metadata? Um, we've gone through this. This is my, actually, I was thinking about this. Don't ever think about these things. This is my 29th year of working on metadata around resources. So you begin to feel old uh, when you're doing that. But, uh, you know, there are a number of existing uh, metadata standards. You know, IAAA, LOM, the Learning Object Metadata, um, Dublin Core, which developed a set of metadata around um, digital assets and such, SCORM, part of IMS and some of that work, and then some of our own personal metadata that we've all developed around the products, whether we knew we were doing that or not. So why another metadata standard? Um, <clears throat> when we take a look at that, the, the LRMI's goal is really to make it easier and more convenient to find learning resources, it's not just about cataloging, but it's about the usability of that catalog to be able to find the resources that are available. And uh, it really is the intersection between some real important opportunities. One is uh, the availability of um, curriculum standards. <clears throat> this is not just a US-centric process. This is very much an international initiative. And whether it's a national set of standards, standards around things like inter international baccalaureate or other kinds of programs, any standard can exist there. Schema.org is actually an initiative with put together by Google, Yahoo, Bing, Yandex, a number of other indices companies that said we need to have a standardized way to be able to actually um, identify metadata and then be able to search and filter on that metadata. And uh, so schema.org actually is not just for education, it's a number of industries. Um, and uh, that's an important piece is that there's now a centralized, standardized way to use that kind of metadata to search that's beyond just education. And the last one is looking at registries, some of the technologies that have emerged around these kind of distributed indices of metadata and ways that we can begin to leverage that as part of our businesses to help make those resources findable um, and be able to make that data available. It's no longer Right? We all remember. We don't, it's no longer just distributing something on a diskette or a CD. It now makes its way through the internet, and we need to have some standardized ways to find that. Um, so how, this, this effort's really different um, than some of the others in that we need this common set of descriptors. And, and you know, the funny thing about the word common, I love the ambiguity of the English language. For those of you who may know me, I love telling puns. And unfortunately, common is not very common. 
Um, the fact that we find those commonalities, it doesn't actually exist very often. Um, and education benefits in this case by not going it alone, but in fact leveraging an existing industry initiative. Um, uh, and even though there are always trade-offs, anytime you standardize something, the trade-offs here really far, um, uh, are, are far overcome by the real benefits that come by having a standard as an industry that allows us to be able to talk to educators and purchasers of resources. Um, we've lived in a world with different standards, but in fact the internet doesn't really make that as amenable anymore. It makes it very difficult because um, various standards suddenly meet each other where they wouldn't have intersected in any way in the past. Um, this really is an international initiative, and so really we've tried to scope this in such a way that it can reflect standards and grade levels and learning from a variety of levels. Um, and then looking at how this supports individualized learning, teacher collaboration, all these other pieces and how important those are. So I'm going to do a quick, uh, quick video for you. I think we tested this. So this is a, a video telling you a little bit about LRMI. I search at school about one to four times a day. I have to search for school many times a week. Well, I have to search for social studies, biology, language arts, reading, pretty much all of my classes that I take. Most of the time, I do not find what I need. I find overwhelming results, typically like thousands. It's like two million or two thousand. Like I just searched something and there were a million results. Ugh, that is so annoying. I'm really, really frustrated. Like. Ugh. It just takes too long. So frustrating. It takes me a long time to find what I need. You have so many things to have to look through before you actually find what you're really looking for. Sometimes I find it, sometimes I don't. When educators and students search for instructional content and resources, they never know what they're going to find. What they do know is that they'll find thousands of hits and they'll need to spend way too long combing through the search results to find what they need. Right now, my students are spending way too much time searching for the information for the lessons they've been given. If I wasn't spending all my time searching, I could definitely focus on my children. I could be using that time to work on lesson plans or teaching. I wish there was an easier way for my students to find the relevant information. If we could sort by things like grade level or content area, searching could be so much easier. This would make it so much easier for me and my students. And it wouldn't just help me, it would really help parents working with their kids at home. The Learning Resource Metadata Initiative, or LRMI, is focused on making educational and instructional resources easier to find and more accessible for educators, students, and their families. The LRMI is a project co-led by the Association of Educational Publishers and Creative Commons. The project mission is to develop a standard metadata framework for educational content. When a critical mass of educational content is described and tagged in a consistent and uniform manner, filtering this content will become substantially easier for both users and delivery platforms. The framework will encompass the most commonly used and critical tags for instructional resources, criteria such as grade level, content area, standards alignments, copyright and licensing considerations, media types such as print, video or digital, and other search filters. If adopted by the major search engines, these filtering criteria will appear on the browser screen when educators and students conduct searches. By simply defining their search using these standard filters, they'll get the exact resources they need at the precise moment they need them. For publishers and content developers, it means that their products and programs will be more discoverable for the teachers and students who need them. It's so much easier for my students to use. It's so much easier. I have a lot more time now just to focus on teaching. I can spend more time doing my homework and less time searching. And my students are so much less frustrated and so much more excited to learn. I get less results, but they mean more. As a teacher, it really meets my needs. Yes!
the Learning Resource Metadata Initiative, improving search for teaching and learning. So um, hopefully that helped clarify and pull together some of the things I had described originally about LRMI and the benefits. I think it's important to recognize that you as publishers, as you're participating, um, you're actually helping both in the discovery of instructional resources and then also around the commerce in terms of marketing and awareness. And I liken this in many ways to sort of the 1400s as the reason why, why the ships hit the seas to look around the world um, for the purpose of discovery and commerce. And hopefully that'll create an image in your mind about LRMI and, and sort of the place it plays in terms of changing our world just as those early explorers changed our world as well. Um, so the process itself is a process of describing the resource in terms of these sets of tags, and we'll go into a little bit more detail, then publishing that um, in a number of different formats depending on where it's going to be used. You saw correctly that, in fact, this schema is, is adopted by Google, Yahoo, uh, Bing, and other engines. So I, I don't care if people provide education-specific search engines. Clearly, that's interesting. But in fact, the first place that most people go is one of those search engines to find things. And um, this will actually help refine that process. So making it evident within there and then really supporting the kind of search that takes place. So um, again, that process going through this. And uh, we've really tried to simplify how to describe that process. Um, and you're actually maybe sitting on that. And that is your T-shirt that you have here that we've given you. And we have this simple uh, logo, uh, tag me, find me, and lure me. By the way, the technical people in your companies, they beg for these. So it's really a nerdly thing. But so take one or more. Um, there are open source taggers. We'll talk a little bit about some of those. Uh, uh, the, we'll talk about some of the work that's happening in learning media around that. Um, and these are available for you to use as they are or for you to modify and change and use within your own tool sets. Um, there are LRMI enable sort of better search. Um, this is actually an example. This is the famous potato salad search. Um, if you learn about LRMI, you need to learn about potato salad. Isn't that a nice thing? It all comes back to food. Um, and uh, in the potato salad search, you search on this in Google, um, and what you'll notice is that there are a set of metadata that actually come up along the left side, where you can actually indicate, I want it without mayonnaise, I want it without potatoes. What is potato salad without potatoes? But in fact, there, is, there are recipes that way. Imagine the same thing occurring in education, um, where we then, instead of it being about recipes, it's about instructional media and being able to say, I want something for uh, a child at ages 10 to 12 about fractions, and I want it for remediation purposes. The ability to be able to call down and make use of those resources is incredibly powerful, not just for classes as they exist today, but for looking at more individualized and personalized kinds of learning in terms of how we find those resources. From your perspective as a publisher, it means your resources are e more easily found, and it means that they're more easily used. There's nothing worse than having a resource sitting in the back room that could be doing something powerful and not being used because somebody didn't know they had it. Um, it also enables sort of better search. There's actually some other searches that are available. This is the education version of that. So we looked on fractions, and we brought up um, looking at age range, educational use, and our activity type. We've then been able to cull that list. And there's actually a new version of that search available that's going to be up and running here in the next week. Um, so you can take a look at some of that. We can get you all of that information as it becomes available. So with that said, let me turn this over to Jason, um, who's a participating publisher, Learning Media, and uh, absolutely a wonderful partner as part of one of the many publishers we're working with. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Michael. Guten Tag, kia ora, hello. Uh, it's, it's great being here, and, uh, and I'm trying to follow in uh, Michael's uh, great footsteps on this uh, presentation. Uh, first off, a little bit about Learning Media. Uh, we are New Zealand's largest and oldest education publisher. Uh, we specialize in print and digital. Um, we develop digital infrastructure uh, for education and also for health. Um, and also we provide professional development for schools both within New Zealand and internationally. Um, our organization, or our, our company, is, uh, is a government-owned company. Um, and one of, uh, one of our key clients is the Ministry of Education in New Zealand. So we uh, essentially provide a lot of the backbone um, learning um, support for the Ministry of Education in New Zealand. 
That said, we're also a global publisher and developer, and that's one area of my particular focus, particularly in terms of uh, developing, marketing and selling resources, both within New Zealand and also internationally. Uh, Learning Media is also the developer and the host of New Zealand's largest metadata-driven uh, sector portal, Te Kite Ipurangi, TKI, uh, for the Ministry of Education, which is essentially a learning hub for all New Zealand educators to access uh, resources and learning, um, learning support provided by the Ministry of Education. From my side though, um, particularly because I need to turn a profit and I need to make sure that my products are, are reaching the market. Um, there are a number of market drivers, both from our perspective, but also from our market's perspective. So first off, uh, the commercial side. We need to deliver a profit to the company. We need to be sustainable moving forward into the future, and especially into the digital future, and we need to provide growth. What our market needs, though, as well, the teachers need support. You know, we all recognise that teachers are very time poor, and they need information right now and right here but that information also needs to be relevant to what they're learning and what they're needing to teach. So essentially, they need to go online and they need to find the information they, wanted, they want to teach um, and support their students at the click of a button. So our challenges and our opportunities moving forward from a product perspective is in the global world, there's now a plethora of competitors within our markets. We need to ensure that our products are relevant still to our market we need to ensure that they're discoverable to our market. You know, I'm not sure about in other markets, but certainly within New Zealand, the, uh, the growth in catalog has just turned into a slump because teachers just don't like to receive and they don't have the time to review piles and piles of pages of catalogs of product that may not be relevant to them. We need to ensure that our products are accessible to the market as well, and we need to have the channels and the speed to the market. Most of these are also our market's challenges and opportunities as well. Teachers are being, uh, are being swamped by a plethora of providers and a, and, a, and a plethora of products, not just from publishers or traditional education publishers, but uh, from ex-teachers or existing teachers, people who aren't involved in education. Um, so suddenly, the, the world of education resources has just ballooned. They still need to know whether those resources are relevant to what they're wanting to teach, they need to ensure that they can discover those resources and that they can access them really quickly. And they also need to ensure that there are channels and speed to market so that if at a click of a button, the resource that they want to teach tomorrow is already on their iPad. So really, I, um, I got into, um, into the world of discoverability with metadata um, not too long ago um, and certainly looking forward in terms of how we're going to actually meet the challenges and the needs of, of our markets and of our company. It can be simplified really, really, um, really easily. So metadata is changing the way that we stay relevant and accessible to our market. But from our market's perspective, it's changing the way that they can access information that's relevant to their needs. So essentially, it's bridging the gap between ourselves and our market. But there are challenges at the moment. So search engines generally guess what a web page is about by looking at the contents of that page. At the moment, or until LRMI, they haven't really been structured for educational resources. LOM is a really good uh, metadata standard that we use, um, but it's really complex, and we use, we use it um, extensively in TKI. Um, but it is an incredibly complex metadata schema, and it's not recognized still by the search engines. So the challenge that we face, or have been facing, is that there has been no met metadata schema for education. That means there's been a hit and miss chance of resource descriptions being found by, by the search engines. It's been difficult to refer to or describe resources using terms that everyone understands and that are common across, uh, across both our market and multiple markets. And then it's difficult to link up and query or browse across the resources. So from an ideal perspective, resources could be found more easily. We can provide structured browsing or a collection or linking of resources, and that's both within collections and across collections. 
resources can be better aligned or described against curricula and standards, and that's, that's a really important um, piece for us to look at because obviously within the US there's a common core, but we need to ensure as a global publisher that the, that the metadata that we are putting up is, is consistent across multiple markets and multiple standards. And in the end, we want better engaged and informed education customers to make life easier for them and make our resources more accessible to them. So from a pure publishing example, um, we, we ran some tests at Learning Media. Um, and the first off was, uh, was looking for one of our resources without, without metadata. So here's, here's a resource. Actually, I'll just go back there. Here's a resource. With no metadata, it's not discoverable on, on the search engines. So if I'm wanting to sell this product into a market, I have to work really hard and largely through traditional advertising to ensure that the market actually understands what this metadata or what this resource is about. Then once we start embedding some metadata, we can start seeing quite a few, um, quite a few uh, tags coming up in terms of the resource. So it's starting to become more discoverable. And you can see here, we've got a few things like description. Um, there's a description there about, about the book. Um, we start listing the author. So people searching on, on a particular author, and one of our authors is Joy Cowley. We have Margaret Mahi, so two very popular authors. So we can start using that metadata so that if somebody's searching on that, on that author, they can start discovering our resources or our collections that, have, that feature that author. LRMI takes it a whole lot further. So it embeds much more detailed um, tags in terms of uh, in terms of leveling, um, curriculum areas, and standards alignment. Um, and so it suddenly makes our resource so much more accessible to our market. Now, in the preparation for this, one of our techies, I'm, and I have to admit, I'm not a techie, I'm a publisher. Um, so one of our techies um, has developed a, a better tool for testing, or one simple tool for testing. Um, and you can download this from the, uh, from the, from the Chrome store. Um, but this is an extension for the Chrome browser, and it detects and shows that there's microdata, LRMI and other, which is embedded in the page, and displays this in a tabular display. So it makes it really easy, and you can download that really simply. And back to you, Michael. Thanks a lot. You know, we've, we've worked with Learning Media, and uh, I've just met Jason this time, but he... Uh, he is the same quality as the quality people at all of Learning Media, just a delight to work with. So um, it's really wonderful. Um, what does LRMI actually enable? This is where the rubber meets the road. Um, really talking about a number of different things. Just standard search tools, standard type in search. But imagine an integrated search where an educator's described an instructional lesson um, in terms of some terms as part of their planning process. Imagine a tool that automatically rolls up resources um, that relate to that lesson because of the tags that are inherent within that. A teacher may not even know they're doing a search or conducting a search, but in fact, it's very powerful because of the standardization. Looking at integration of catalogs of resources. Some, of, some companies are, of course, aggregators of different materials. By having a standardized um, set of metadata, you now can coalesce some of those materials and really be able to have a more powerful conversation with your customers about your offerings. Um, really being able to support, as I already said, individualized learning, looking at the needs of a particular learner. I think we're seeing shifts in funding um, around resources. Um, movement from simply looking at institutional purchase to more of an individualized kind of approach. And, and LRMI will be there to help support that kind of movement. And there's actually much, much more. So what I want to do is show you another video um, on an example of how LRMI can be used in a really progressive manner. Um, the Gates Foundation has funded something called the Shared Learning Collaborative. Um, and it actually is based on LRMI, um, uses that kind of tagging. But it has another side, which is actually called Paradata, I hate to throw out all the words, right? Um, but Paradata, which is data about learning. So it's really meta metadata. Um, and I think this, you'll enjoy seeing this video and maybe some of the ways that LRMI will change the way we uh, teach and the way students learn. Here's a teacher with just a few of the students in a typical classroom. Brandon and Maria and Karen and Jimmy. Each is unique, they're at different stages and need different ways to get where they need to go. She has ideas for how to help each one. But to do that forces her to focus on each student. Think about the teaching tools and approaches that help each student on their journey. 
deal with truckloads of student data that may or may not work together or with other teaching materials she likes to use, then come up with a specific plan and get the best lessons and content for it. And the tools for all of this just add more complexity. As a result, it's nearly impossible for her to give each of her students exactly what they need, unless she has better tools. And the Shared Learning Collaborative is creating shared data services to make data speak the same language and make it easier to create teaching materials that work with that data, which opens the door to creating new, customized learning maps and curriculum, along with an engine to easily find and share them. So when Maria needs an extra challenge to keep her engaged with math, or Brandon needs a different approach to reading, one that works with his love of spaceships, it's at her fingertips. It also helps her turn that flood of assessment and formative data into something that gives actual insight, so she can see exactly where they are and what they need and adapt in real time. Tools that give teachers better access to information from each other, across the hall or across the country. The SLC has launched the services necessary to build better tools for our teachers and classrooms, including a cloud-based data store, standardized metadata tagging language, and an open license API for building software applications, which will help developers make software that actually works together, giving teachers easy access to data and resources for the millions of students already waiting to benefit from what can be created from these shared services. And as more schools join, we get lower integration costs, more meaningful data, and better tools for everybody. SLC has made some examples just a hint at the possibilities. This means that teachers are free to teach personally, while developers can meet new challenges and even create new possibilities for every student in just the right way. Shared services work best when they're truly shared. SLC is making that sharing happen now. Join in. So the, the Shared Learning Collaborative is just one example of uh, an, an early initiative that's really taking advantage of the, learning, uh, of the LRMI. But within each of your organizations, as you look at the creation and movement towards digital assets, um, the, you'll find in interesting ways to be able to, to take advantage of this kind of standardized kinds of metadata. Um, the AEP is actually funded through the end of February to work with publishers, hands-on, um, to support really looking at how the LRMI can play a role in your, in your organization and your resources. So um, the AEP is actually contracted with my organization, Educational Systemics, and we spend time with each publisher really talking about not just how their resources can be represented within the LRMI, but also how does it fit within the workflow within your organization? How might you think differently about your products and assets? The, really, the goal here is to help jumpstart um, your use of the LRMI and really see it immediately have a positive impact on the nature of your business. <clears throat> so uh, the LRMI and the SLC, this is a more comp. If any of you are techie, you'll enjoy seeing this. If you're not, you may just glaze over. Um, again, a set of repositories of data, um, having ways to be able to coalesce those and then ultimately end up with educators and students being able to find the resources they're looking for. So I'll quickly go through progress and timeline. Initially, through phase one, we actually did the development of the specification. A number of publishers and others were involved in that process of defining the uh, learning objects that are included within, uh, within the specification. Um, that was actually completed uh, in January of 2012, pretty recent. Um, but moving very quickly, we now have an, a submission into schema.org that's going through the final review um, as we're moving ahead. Um, the properties, um, there's actually a handout. You can see those in there. We're happy to send you this presentation. There's some standard uh, properties which are, have to do with any kind of resource, whether it's learning or not. And then there's a set of six that are specific to education. This is actually an old version here, but um, looking at intended user, educational use, time required, uh, age range, for example, um, interactivity type, what's the manner in which the learner interacts with that, and then uh, the actual type of learning resource. And then there's a set of competency related, that's that standards related, learning standards related pieces. And again, it's a very open schema, can accommodate virtually any, see if I say all, somebody will find one but in fact virtually any kind of standard, uh, curriculum related standard. Um, so an example in a little bit more detail, if we look at re learning resource type, um, we had worked with over 300 publishers to identify a common set of what we call recommended values. 
you're not tied to these values. It doesn't tie you into this. But what we also found is that having spent time in this marketplace, we have a tendency not to converge. We tend to diverge as a community as we argue over the little pieces. So what we said is, let's just come up with a set that people can work on, and we'll continue to evolve that over time. So this has to do with the kind of, of resource type, whether it be presentation, microcomputer-based lab, test, quiz, any of those, you can then tag that so that it can be found and used in that fashion. Um, phase two is happening right now, which is the proof of concept. Uh, we, we thought about calling it a beta, but really proof of concept sounds much more progressive and much more about interactivity with the users. Um, and that's the goal, is to see, as we're tagging this, how is it used? How does it result in a good quality ser um, search and finding good resources? So we've done a number of things, um, awareness building, the proof of concept itself, collaboration around Tagger and search with a number of organizations, um, working with publisher surveys and trying to get feedback on the process, and then encouraging and supporting the adoption by schema.org so that they'll turn that on probably next summer, let's say, and some people will go into Google and, and be able to look for a resource and be able to actually filter that down by those attributes. Um, in round one, we had a, a, a number of large and smaller publishers that participated. Um, they've jumped in, they've said this is important to the industry, and they've tagged a set of resources. In the second phase, in round two, we have, actually the number is much higher, I think we have 47 publishers now that are actively pursuing um, implementing LRMI. We have 700 resources in the queue. As I said, we're funded through the end of February. Honestly, the piece that scares me the most is everybody's gonna get excited, and it comes February 15th, and everybody's gonna say, do me! Um, and we're going to say, oh no, where were you in December when we could have helped? So we want people to get involved sooner than later so that we can actually say yes and work with you actively. Um, we have a number of new publishers who are coming on board, and in fact a number that we've spoken with and been really excited in working with um, from here at the fair. So next steps, we're continuing to tag resources. Uh, we're documenting best practices through the processes that we've been engaging in so that you don't have to, we're making the mistakes that you don't have to. So that's the goal, is to make this easier and easier to use. Um, we're generating some recommendations for the next generation of uh, tagging tools. Uh, we're creating a service providers kit, companies that do tagging already, that are providing those services, to make sure that when you ask for it, they're saying, of course I know about LRMI, I know how to do that. Um, because you may not decide to do it within your organization. There's no reason you wouldn't, but if somebody's already doing tagging for you for a number of other reasons, there's no reason they shouldn't be able to add that service on for you at what we're hoping will be a nominal price. There is no price for you to participate in LRMI, but if others build businesses around that, that's their call. You're not tied into that, you can do it yourself. Honestly, it's not hard. Um, don't tell them I said that. Uh, and then increase the number of participating publishers and shift from us doing tagging for you to really you being able to do the tagging. And uh, I'll guarantee you from my perspective, uh, regardless of whether AEP is funded, um, we're always happy to work with you to make sure that you know how to use those tags. It's something we're passionate about. So how can you participate? Um, one is, um, again, we're here to help you in a number of different ways. I know you are um, but one individual probably in your organization, and we're happily, happy to schedule calls um, with other people in your organization's technical staff and others to talk through the LRMI and answer those questions. It's a very personal process, and it needs to be integrated into how you do your business, and we want to make sure that we're there to help you with that. Um, we're also working on reviewing feedback about the metadata and providing information to show the benefit to your organization. You don't do this because you just want to. It needs to have a business benefit. I think there's significant business benefit, but each one of your organizations is different, and we want to make sure that it fits your needs. So, um, this is too much of a slide for you to have. You can get this, and you can look up some of these pieces, um, and we can, we can send this to you. Um, but lastly, um, here is the emails of the presenters that you saw here today, Charlene, Jason, and me. And uh, within the AEP, Dave Gladney is actually um, the, LR the contact within A AEP for LRMI. And on my staff, uh, Tila Evans is the project manager. Um, and Tila, uh, she is waiting. I always feel like I'm like at 3 a.m. The operators are waiting for your call. Tila wants to hear from you. She's excited about this. And she wants to support you and get you the template, get you the information, and make sure that you can be successful in using this metadata specification. Um, there are a number of us here. Charlene, raise your hand. 
Um, and then Joanne, you're back here, raise your hand. If you can, if, uh, if well, so we'll take Q&A, but if you want to give us your card, we're happy to send you more information about that, including um, a version of this presentation. We can't send you the videos, they're huge. Um, but we'll send you some of the other pieces so that you can do that. So um, do you want to add anything right now, Jason? Are you without, with you without audio? I'm, I'm, oh, here we are. You're on now. I'm on, I'm on. Uh, no, um, if, you, for, if you're thinking from a non-technical perspective, you, um, you just want to ask any, uh, any questions, you know, particularly in terms of uh, where you can see metadata helping you with, uh, or LRMI helping you with product marketing, um, feel free to flick me an email. That's, uh, that's no problem at all. So um, Charlene has a microphone. Thank you, Jason. Cheers. Charlene has a microphone. If you have any questions you want to ask now. Yes, right over here. Char oh, right here. Yes. Pr pr what, what about the language uh, being used for these metadata? Is it only English or how, can, how can, we, can we implement other languages? Very good question. So right now it's localized only in the U.S. because it's only six months, seven months old. Um, uh, we expect that it'll be localized as we work with publishers in those geographies and we'll support them in localizing that process. The other part I want to point out is that, you remember we saw that age range listed there? Um, there's also a mapping to looking at a grade level or a, a, whether it's a letter or a numerical grade. And we actually have a schema for making sure that we can communicate that and accommodate any way that they organize it. Um, you know, any national organization around grade level in those pieces. But that'll be coming for sure. Yes. Oh, there, there was a question here. Good day. Two questions. Uh, the first. Uh Will I have to use some extra software or plugin for my browser to use L to use this system? Or no. it, w it will work in standard browser, yes? In standard browser. Yes, without standard, plugins. yes. Standard browser. So if you go and of course, you know, Google serves up a different a different search engine variation depending on where you are geographically. So um, we don't know how pervasive that is with the red. We haven't gone to every country to test that. But um, uh, it actually comes up automatically in Google now on the left side for the recipes. Like other, other filters, yes? Like other filters that they already. Yeah, that other fields that are there, but this, this field, exactly, would come up there. It, the education, the LRMI metadata, is not yet being served through. So it's probably we're expecting that by next summer we'll see that available. And the second question, how it, how it will fit, uh, for example, CMS, already existing CMS, for example, Drupal, yeah. Joomla, or something like this. So I have to put special plugin to my system, CMS system, to put these tags on my products. So um, for those of you who aren't, so see content management systems that may be used already within, um, within your, your organizations. Um, we're actually working with organizations who do mapping to an LRMI set of fields around that. So you don't necessarily need to ex You can create an export to the LRMI um, data. So we're using an HTML microdata format as well as JSON output. But most of the CMSs will support that anyhow. So um, it, it's actually pretty simple. There's a very limited number of fields, very easy to use. And we're talking to a number of those CMS providers about how they can overtly support LRMI. Thank you. You're welcome. Does the uh, initiative cover higher education, colleges, and universities? I, I can't hear you. Sorry. Just, mo just a little bit lo closer to your mouth. Does the initiative cover higher education, universities, and colleges? So um, this does not address the needs of higher education. It really is intended for primary and secondary school. Um, you know, the, the, and in fact, I was just talking to another publisher about that yesterday. The way that higher ed searches for resources is so fundamentally different in terms of the use cases. Um, uh, uh, and, and there are other standards that they're using around that. It's been K-12 that has been the, the stepsister and has not had those kinds of standards available up to this point. Yeah. Oh, another question. There's a limit of three, by the way. So you're on your last note. Go ahead. Uh, so my question is, who will, define, who will define the algorithm of ranging in this? What organization will define the algorithm of ranging uh, in browser? How, uh, oh, you, of, the, of, you're saying ranking. Ranking, yes. Yeah, ranking. So, so that's a really good, that's a great question. So LRMI has nothing to do with the ranking, because the ranking is really about the business um, the business model used by the engine. 
honestly, um, it, it's interesting. The schema.org allows uh, these, these different providers to come together and produce a common index. But in fact, they cannot work together around how they implement that because it's an antitrust issue. So they can't collaborate. So how they decide to monetize that, how they offer that kind of ranking, we don't know and we kind of can't ask. So um, I think you'll see some of the same strategies. I think the good news is that the LRMI use as a filter will, even as they do that ranking, it's going to help bring more relevant resources to the top for everybody who's actually using that. So, you know, uh, and it's just standard usage patterns. More questions? Oh, we have one back here, and then I'll come to you. Just a small one, Michael. Uh, yeah. can, you can you remind me again who Creative Commons is or are? That's a really good question. Um, the, the Creative Commons typically works with um, open education resources, um, a set of, uh, of license uh, models for open, for open resources. Um, it has been really progressive about looking at how you, f about identifying resources on the web um, and really how to manage those pieces. And I think that the relationship between the AEP and the Creative Commons really creates a nice balance in the implementation of LRMI so that it addresses this new influx of open education resources, while at the same time bringing in the, the, the for-profit kind of resources and really the melding of those two, which is really going to define our future. Yes, question. Uh, today your scope is uh, English language and um, mathematics. Do you plan to extend your scope to other subjects such as foreign languages? Yes, and so, um, so the, hopefully you heard the question. Right now it's in English. Um, and it's in the areas of mathematics. It's actually mathematics and language arts. Um, and so we have those two core curriculum areas. We actually started out with just looking at upper elementary and middle school level kinds of areas. Because if you're doing a proof of concept, I think you'll all appreciate this. If you're doing a proof of concept, um, if your search results in only one resource, um, filtering is not very interesting. So we had to find a way to sort of reduce that into a, 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 and get some depth so we could do the comparison. We're broadening that, and we expect as we come to understand better about the search, we're going to reach out, go into science, um, and go into the social sciences are a little trickier around some of the common metadata, but we'll certainly take that on and go in that direction. That's, and that's a broader group um, around, uh, around the, the actual implementation, the task force around LRMI, but the expectation is that we'll grow. Important to recognize the spec has only been around for six months right now. Yeah, and, and, and it's important to point out, we, you, you don't need, we want you to participate, not just to tag your resources, but to provide input into the use. This is something that's going to help define some of the possibilities for your business in the future. And by participating now, it's much easier to affect a change at this point in this kind of specification than it is to wait till a year or two years and people are start using it. And it's a lot harder to create a change now. So all I can say is a call to arms, get involved. Um, and, uh, and, and put your two cents in. Think about your business models and think about how you're going to make use of that and, and make it work for your business. That's the goal.